So welcome everyone. My name is Tom Menz. I'm a professor in software engineering here in the Faculty of Science. Um, and my goal uh, today is to try to provide you some uh, tricks, tips and tricks to become a successful PhD student. Well, it's not up to me uh, to, well, <laughs> it will basically be your task to be successful as a PhD, PhD student. I'm just going to provide you some useful feedback of uh, things that I have learned throughout my own PhD, also during the, my career when I was uh, postdoc, uh, and of course when I was professor and I have been guiding PhD students uh, myself. So it's a kind of uh, lessons learned and hopefully you will uh, learn something out of it, not only for your PhD, but uh, also for your future career, hopefully. So uh, the main goal here, as I said, just is to provide you some advice, guidelines, tips and tricks for uh, you as a PhD student to uh, become more effective. What are the types of things that can help you in doing this? Uh, after my talk, uh, if you want to know more, if you want to contact me, here is my email address. So you can always uh, contact me by email or you can, well, or any other channel where you can find me. Um, so let me just maybe give a little bit of back more background of me. So I already said I'm a professor at the software engineering lab. I've actually, I've been working at the University of Mons since uh, 2003, so it's already quite a long time. Uh, I did my PhD uh, way too long ago, between 1993 and 1999, at the University in Brussels, uh, the Flemish one, the VUB. Uh, after this, I became a postdoc researcher for four, well, th three years plus one year of project funding. Uh, this was as the FWO, which is the counterpart of the FNRS. Uh, and then I became a first assistant, then associate, and then full professor at this university since 2003. Uh, actually, since the beginning, I have been uh, the, um, the leader of the software engineering lab here at the university, at the Faculty of Science. PhD-wise, uh, here I've just listed the last generation, or like the last 10, 12 years of PhD students that I have been, uh, have, I have had the honor to uh, guide. Uh, most of them, well, the right part, they already defended. The left part, these are ongoing. Uh, hopefully these two will defend like in 2025, and these might be a little bit later because they just started. Uh, so this shows you that, uh, that I already have quite some experience with guiding PhD students uh, successfully since uh, they all, at least on the right hand side, they all, they all already successfully uh, defended. Uh, maybe uh, to start with, just to get to learn you as well, uh, this, this presentation will be interactive. Uh, so I don't know if you have any computer-like device with you, can be a smartphone, can be anything else, a smart uh, laptop or whatever. Uh, if you don't, uh, if the resolution is not uh, enough to scan this, you can just type uh, this on whatever your machine you have. Uh, okay, maybe I have to activate it because... Okay, so you have a pretty good balance between uh, first year PhD students, second year, third year, uh, so that's good. Um, I just wanted to know this to know how to balance my uh, presentation. Some tips are more useful in the beginning, others are more useful in the end. Uh, okay, good. Well, you can continue to fill in if you didn't uh, do it yet. Uh, another one, maybe another question just to get uh, acquainted with you is uh, this one. Uh, in which faculty or school do you conduct your PhD research? So let me just open that question. So, mostly engineering, medicine, and pharmacy. So, I expect this to be reflecting the amount of PhD students available more or less in each uh, faculty. Okay, so now that I have uh, already some information from uh, you. Uh, let me uh, start with the real presentation. So, uh, okay, as you probably are already aware as a PhD student, it's not always easy to be a PhD student. You have to be kind of a juggler, trying to get lots of balls in the air at the same time. So you have to do lots of different activities. 
uh, you need to have technical skills, social skills, whatever. Uh, you have to do maybe teaching, a little bit of research, maybe some administration, maybe uh, uh, do something related to uh, companies. Can be lots of different things. So that's one of the most uh, different, difficult challenges, I think, as a PhD student. You can uh, replace these balls of any specific uh, type of activity that you have to do. Uh, and you will, you know, I don't think there will be any case where you don't have to like uh, be a juggler uh, with these uh, uh, trying to keep uh, different balls in the end uh, and keep them all uh, in the air, which is difficult if you're not a juggler. The first time you try to do this is something you have to learn, right? Um, that's as a PhD student. Uh, if you're a postdoc, I think the situation is a little bit more uh, worse because <laughs> you have to be a juggler with lots of different balls in your hands. And maybe there is an audience beyond, uh, bes uh, around you, like in a circus, where people are all uh, looking at you at the same time, which makes it a little bit more stressful. Uh, and okay, this even goes becomes worse if you become a professor or a professional, where uh, like you have to like juggle 20, 25 balls in the uh, in the air at the same time. Occasionally, you have to try to while doing this uh, pick up some other ball and start juggling with this, or uh, maybe someone some some ball falls uh, on the ground. You have to pick it up while all the others still have to be in the air. So that's a uh, kind of situation. So I think you can consider yourself. Um, uh, happy that you're only in this very simple <laughs> case right now. Uh, maybe yet another question here, um, just to see. Um, okay, what are like the, the, di the, diff diff the different, the specific qualities you think you should have or abilities that you should have to become a successful PhD student? I'm not talking about the, the skills you have to learn as a PhD student, but really abilities, qualities that a successful PhD student should have. So I will already open uh, the question here. So this is a little bit more open-ended. Uh, so okay, for quality, ability, anything like uh, that ends with ET is probably a good quality. <laughs> uh, so try to be short and have one single uh, noun for each answer. If you, have, if you think of multiple qualities, you can uh, add, this, add them all. Um, Okay, I see that, okay, we start uh, seeing some questions. I will do it with the word cloud because uh, there might be a lot of variation in the types of things you see. So I expect that probably, yeah, like, because uh, you don't always use the same word. You have organized, organization, organized. So uh, yeah, it's normal that we, s we see the same words appearing. I will clean this up to have uh, it uh, uh, later uh, more differently. But okay, we already see some, uh, qualities that uh, will probably appear. I will uh, show you the results I got from the last time I gave this presentation and I don't expect this to be very different. So you can continue to add uh, more words like this if you can uh, think of something. I will show you the results uh, that I got from a uh, previous time I gave this uh, and I think uh, when based on a quick look I, I have made on the word cloud uh, most of the things that you mentioned uh, are there. Uh, so you have to be persistent, perseverant, resilient, that's kind of the same things. Curious, um, open, ambitious, uh, um, no, um, you have to have ambition, passionate, motivated. If you're more in the scientific domain, have critical thinking, scientific attitude, open-minded, be a problem solver, be structured, responsible, autonomous, independent, honesty, integrity. So there is lots and lots of qualities that can help you in uh, be being a good PhD student. I hope and assume you have uh, many of those. Okay, so this is about like qualities, abilities that you want to, that you should have uh, preferably uh, many of those uh, when starting a PhD. Now, uh, the, the, this question is slightly different. It's like, okay, when you're doing your PhD, you will also acquire new skills. You will acquire new skills and you should acquire new skills. So it's about like what are the types of skills that you think are necessary uh, that you need to acquire to successfully do, do, uh, do your PhD and also which are the skills that you will uh, naturally acquire while doing your PhD uh, and that might be like secondary skills that could be useful like for your further career even if it's not your specific uh, goal. Well, what we already see is lots of uh, managerial skills like time management, stress management. Oops, sometimes it goes away because it's switch. Every time there's a new question, it uh, re reorders the, uh, the Wordle. Time management, stress management, what project management, management in general, 
so that's clearly the managerial skills. Then, of course, everything that's related to social skills like communication, uh, uh, leadership is also a kind of manager managerial skill. And then, of course, uh, since you're doing a most likely a technical PhD or something related to science, you will have all, all these theoretical technical skills, scientific skills, technical skills, scientific rigor. Uh, so yeah, so that's the kind of type of things that I was expecting to see. Uh, actually, here there is a kind of discrepancy between what, uh, like, trying to explain to, I don't know if you already uh, tried to explain what you're doing in your PhD to your mother or your grandmother or, or uh, some other family member or some friends. And then probably, okay, I, when, if, even when I try to explain this to my wife, uh, <laughs> I don't uh, manage to do this. Uh, so basically, when you, well, when you typically try to explain your PhD or even your research after this, this to uh, someone else that is not necessarily in a scientific domain. Uh, they will say, okay, you're an expert in a particular discipline, which is probably the case. Uh, so you're really an expert in a particular discipline. And that's probably what people think that you learn during a PhD. You will become a world leader expert in a very narrow scientific or other uh, domain. Uh, so yes, that's definitely something you learn in a PhD. But uh, this is just a very small part of the big picture because what you actually learn when you're doing a PhD, this is this. Okay, you have this expert knowledge, but like, okay, in this case, I don't know the exact percentages, uh, but I have put all of the different uh, types of things, things that you will learn that you have to master during your PhD. Okay, you will have this expert knowledge, but you have to have good reading skills. You have to read scientific papers all the time. Writing skills, you will have to write papers. You will have to write a PhD dissertation, of course. Communication skills, we already saw it in the words clouds. Everyone, um, well, like uh, half of you mentioned this as an important skill. Presentation skills, okay, that's kind of the same thing. Uh, not necessarily, because communicating is about how you will talk to other people about your research. Presentation is how you will disseminate your scientific research. So you can do communication for many different reasons, not only for presenting your research. Collaboration, all of this is like, like the social skills. I think social skills is even here. I didn't really structure it in a good way. Project management, time management, you already mentioned this before. Critical thinking, problem solving, technical skills. So I think everything that I have seen on the word cloud, it's here. These are all of the types of things that you will learn during your PhD. And most of them uh, will actually be useful in whatever uh, job that you're going to do after your PhD, regardless of whether it's a scientific uh, or it's a, it's a job in academia or in industry. So yeah, the reading is obvious. You have to constantly be aware of the state of the art and the state of practice within your domain. So you have to keep aware of the scientific uh, literature. The writing is also, also obvious. Uh, you have to uh, basically, yeah, whenever you write a PhD dissertation or a paper, you will have to write something. You will get probably mm, occasionally, maybe even frequently, negative reviews from uh, the reviewers that read your paper. And then you have to try to revise your paper uh, to make it better and so on. So it's really something that you learn from the beginning until the end. Uh, if I take mo most of my PhD students, when they start their PhD, they are very bad writers. And at the end, they, come, they become either good writers to excellent uh, writers. So it's something that's not easy to master and something that needs a lot of uh, time to do this. Same for presentation skills. It's something you learn by doing. It's not something that you can master if you don't have enough experience. So if you're not a good read, reading is probably the easy part, but if you're not a good writer or presenter, the only good ways to do this is to practice and try to really take every occasion you can to do this. Uh, you shouldn't be afraid of this. It can be stressful, uh, but by doing it, uh, you will reduce the stress level uh, little by little. What is it, the real reason why you actually started? Why, why did you want to start doing a, P, a PhD? What is your driver behind it? Why do you want to do this? There can be many different reasons why uh, you actually want to do a PhD. I think and I expect that many of the reasons you're going to provide is related to some of the things you mentioned before. If you want to do a PhD, the, the most important thing I think is motivation. If you're not motivated to do a PhD, then it will be difficult to always keep uh, in mind the, the big picture and you will probably have difficulties to continue doing this. So having a good motivation is very important. So I just wanted to know what are the different motivations you had? It can be one single motivation. Maybe have you, you have two different main drivers that uh, allow you to uh, do a PhD. 
Uh, okay, so I see some uh, of the questions that are like, uh, you already like think uh, further ahead, uh, okay, because you want to have a fulfilling car career, so I guess this is after the PhD, you want to uh, remain within, uh, I, I assume this, I'm not sure, uh, you have this, you have academic career, so uh, uh, this is like uh, having a long-term goal in mind, probably because you enjoy science a lot, uh, you enjoy doing research, and that's why you want to do this all of your time, I guess that you will probably see the same, yeah, here, same here, uh, research. Uh, okay, here I see thesis. Okay, if your driver is to have a thesis, maybe there should be something more than just, uh, I'm doing a PhD because I want to have a PhD thesis. I think there should be something more than just, the, the end goal of a PhD thesis should not be the thesis itself. This is just a starting point. You also have to think a little bit further ahead. Once you have your PhD thesis, what is the next uh, step uh, in your uh, career? Okay, becoming an expert in your domain, that's probably because you like the domain a lot and you want to share your knowledge with uh, other people. Or it can be because like, uh, okay, you have a solve a societal problem, solve a health problem. You really want to, in a specific domain, be helpful in some way. So yeah, actually all of these are of the same nature. Solve a societal problem, solve real world problems, solve a health problem. You you are probably uh, very interested in one specific domain, which might be science, health, law, whatever, and uh, you want to uh, actually help other people uh, by sharing your knowledge and to become uh, better in this knowledge. So here uh, again I list some of the answers I got from previous presentations that I gave. Uh, one of them is uh, basically just because you're curious, and you want to learn new things. Uh, so this is the first one, scientific curiosity. Because you really say, I'm really passionate about research, research is what I want to do, it's something, something that I cannot live without doing research, so the best way for me to do this is to actually get a PhD scholarship uh, and to, to do this all of the time. I like to learn, I like to discover new things, uh, so if this is uh, your passion and you would like to do this, then of course it's it's obvious that you, you're doing a PhD, so it gives you a sense of uh, self-fulfillment. It's a kind of a vocation. The other one is, okay, um, yeah, you want to create new, new knowledge. We also saw this in the Wordle uh, clouds. Uh, so you want to become an expert, what we saw, uh, an expert. You want to solve complex problems. You want to expand the state of the art in your particular domain uh, of research. Uh, so this is about, okay, uh, the, the intellectual challenge. And then of course the other one, this, I saw this a little bit less in the word cloud, but like you want to uh, self-development, you want to increase your, not only your knowledge in a specific domain, but uh, if you remember this uh, pie chart, all of the other skills. You want to be able to learn new skills, to, you want to, for example, to become a better teacher. Um, so all of these secondary skills, this could also be an important driver. Maybe this is not, I don't say you have to have all of these drivers. It's just uh, some examples, but I know, for example, sometimes I have PhD students that are like doing 100% of research and that's really what they like. And then I have others that say, no, I cannot do only 100% research. I want to do like, I want to do a bit of research, I also want to do teaching, I also want to do uh, like uh, some project level programming, whatever. Uh, and in that case, uh, they, they, they want to have like more diversity in the types of things they're doing because you cannot always focus on exactly the same thing at the same time. And uh, in that case, uh, like the self-development and trying to become a good teacher uh, and not only a good researcher could also be uh, something good. Now, uh, let me start now with uh, providing you some practical advice, because that was the purpose of uh, today. The, I think the most practical advice that I can give you and that I give to all my PhD students uh, is uh, this one, have a good thesis statement. Uh, so basically, what is a thesis statement? Uh, I don't know if you already have one uh, or if you plan to have one. For me, uh, if you write a PhD dissertation, the first chapter, the introduction of your dissertation, should basically say what is the main goal of, uh, of this research? What is it that you have done during this career of four years of research? So one single, one sentence, two sentences that explains the main idea of your entire four years of research. I'm assuming here, I'm just taking by default four years, it could be three years, it could be more, depending on how long your PhD contract is. 
any type of research that you're doing has to have a main goal and a main ID. So it's a kind of one sentence uh, thing that explains what the reader expects to see in the dissertation. So I make a distinction between the term thesis, which is this, uh, this uh, one sentence goal, and the dissertation, which is the document in which you write everything you did to come towards this goal. So uh, something, one sentence that I'll highlights what is the main idea of the dissertation, what is the goal of this dissertation, and how uh, did you actually, how do you plan to reach this goal? So it's, that's why it's actually very difficult. How can you summarize your entire dissertation of maybe 200 pages in one single sentence? But this is very important because if you, it's like a, um, a typical elevator pitch. If you can explain what you're doing in just one sentence, I'm saying just one sentence, but if you have three sentences, it's perfect for me too. Then uh, you will be, you have a, a really focused thing that you can easily sell to someone and that also helps you to, uh, to go forward. I'm not saying that you have, should have this, this thesis statement in the beginning from the outset. Uh, it might even be that this can slightly evolve, but you shouldn't wait until like uh, two months before uh, submitting your manuscript <laughs> to come up with this thesis statement. Especially because uh, it depends on uh, if you have uh, really a focused way of working or if you tend to be like more diverging and you, you want to work on different things. Uh, having this uh, focus on a specific direction and goal is important because then like if you do some, maybe you do some site uh, uh, side research um, to, to not always do the same thing, then you know, okay, is this part of my main dissertation or not? Uh, if it's not, then probably you shouldn't focus too much effort on, on that part. This is something typically that you cannot do by yourself. You have to talk to your uh, colleagues or to your PhD th th thesis advisor about it. Maybe if you're lucky, the, the, your thesis advisor will come up with this, but ideally I would say it's better that you come up with uh, these types of, uh, this, this type of uh, summary uh, yourself. So the earlier you come up with uh, such a good thesis statement, the better it is because this provides you the general uh, threat towards uh, how to improve your dissertation and also it helps the reader uh, for, s for understanding what you're doing. Especially because now, uh, like in University of Mons, it's required to have uh, every year progress report uh, committee meeting where you have to say how did you do uh, the, this year and how will you continue to advance. If you have this specific thesis statement, it becomes much easier because you say, this is my statement, this is what I'm supposed to do, this is what I already did towards this goal, and this is what I continue to do to towards this goal. If you don't have such a thesis statement, it's much, it might be much more difficult to convince people about uh, what you did. Uh, let me again come back to you and ask you for some uh, advice. So depending on whether you're in your, how, where you are in your career, uh, you, I think you, you can already say like there is specific things during my PhD career that I have already encountered that were maybe uh, difficult and where uh, I was facing a particular problem uh, and so uh, and how did you face this problem so I don't know if you can think of if you don't can cannot think of anything then okay that's it that's so be it but if you have like specific important advice that you think can be valuable for your colleagues here in the room uh, you can always uh, share this try to think of something that's not necessarily uh, any of the skills or abilities you had before, just some specific advice where you say this can be valuable uh, for uh, someone else as well. Okay, let's see already what we got until now. I see there's some very relevant advice, uh, most of it. Uh, life outside of, okay. <laughs> I don't know if I can fix the order so that it doesn't change all the time. Hmm. Maybe you okay, can stop uh, answering now so that this, this, the, the, the list will stay stable. Okay, speak of your difficulties, that's important. When you're, whenever you're facing some difficulty, it doesn't matter which one, try to talk about it as soon as you can to someone. Uh, depending on uh, what is the difficulty you're facing, the person that you want to talk about could be someone else. It could be your advisor if it's some uh, specific uh, research-oriented, research-related one. Maybe you have a difficulty with your advisor. In that <laughs> case, probably you should talk to someone else, maybe from the lab or maybe uh, some colleagues. Or uh, there is also uh, uh, someone in the 
uh, in the AVG, the research department, uh, the research and development department can, that can uh, help you as well. Um, okay, this as well, uh, this is a re re relevant one. Uh, so, yeah, if you want to have progress, uh, try to have regular meetings with your advisors. Uh, okay, we all know that advisors are not always available. Uh, so that's one of the main problems and it's not because, in most cases, it's not because your advisors don't want to talk to you, it's they simply don't have the time. So there one, one way of doing this is to well, first discuss with your advisors about what is the best way of having regular feedback. You could even say like we fix a specific date in the week or if you want to have two, week, two weekly meetings uh, so that we can fix these things. So it's, if it's an, in their agenda, it's much more likely. If you just say, no, I will wait in my office until they come and then I will talk to them, then it's more unlikely that you will uh, have enough time to discuss with this. So planning the meetings ahead of time with your advisors uh, could be useful. So weekly progress mo meetings would be ideal. Maybe this doesn't work uh, month, at least uh, once every month, but preferably more than that uh, would be good. Uh, to avoid the fact that your advisor after one month uh, he says okay I, d I wasn't aware that you were doing this uh, you shouldn't have done this so <laughs> the earlier you uh, talk to him about him or her about what uh, you have been doing the better it is yeah so i think that's also yeah if you uh, have meetings with your advisors you can talk about the problems you're currently facing uh, research wise Starting to read from your first year of thesis, okay, you have to constantly be aware of what's out there. So uh, uh, reading and knowing about your field of research is really very important. It's not only reading for me, it could be like maybe if you're in more in a techni technical domain, knowing the new technology, in your, if you're in a computer science domain, know, knowing the new, the new tools. So it can be like uh, knowing what is the latest state of the art and state of the practice in research, that's very important. And it's starting from the beginning, but until the end. In the beginning, it's much more important because you don't even know your field, but it will stay important, especially to, evo to avoid that you're doing something that someone else is already doing, or even worse, someone else has already done. So that you should probably avoid. This is like having a good balance, family life, uh, work-life balance. Uh, so don't only focus on what your research is. Try to make some me time with your family, with your friends, doing some sports, uh, doing some other uh, cultural activities, whatever. So uh, this needs to be planned in uh, as well. Uh, this we already had. Okay, this is time management. Uh, so if you are uh, bad in uh, respecting a schedule, maybe using a calendar and respecting this calendar could be good. The same here, don't pro procrastinate. If there are things that you have to do, but it's difficult, you don't like to do this. This doesn't mean you should say like, let's do this next week. Uh, just try to do them. Uh, okay, being curious, that's not really uh, an advice. Okay, it's, it's, it's one of the things we've already seen before. So of course you need it. Uh, read like a reviewer. Yeah, that's also an, in, an interesting one. Uh, read like a reviewer. So this actually means that when you're reading a paper, uh, okay, you do it for two, two different reasons. To keep uh, your knowledge within the domain, but sometimes also, to know how actually do other people write papers, write papers that have been accepted. If you have a paper, uh, you read a paper and it's a good paper, see how it has been written. If it has been written, it has already been peer reviewed, it has been published and probably it means that they did something good. Otherwise, <laughs> it would not not have been accepted. Uh, maybe it's good, but maybe it's not perfect. So maybe you could say, okay, if I have, would have written this paper, I could have done it better. These are the types of things that uh, I could uh, do better. Uh, so actually something that I am currently giving as a kind of task to my PhD student is whenever there is a new interesting paper they read, I'm giving them a kind of reviewer template. I, I want them to report, okay, uh, you read, read this paper, I would like you to report to me about the contents of this paper because I don't know about this, it's a new paper that I encounter, uh, but please try to do this by filling in this reviewer template because this gives you two, two different insights. First of all, you will have to read the paper anyway to understand what it's doing and like this you can also like act as a reviewer and s try to be more critical about the contents of the paper. So this could be a good uh, guideline, especially if during your PhD you also become a reviewer. It's more likely that you will be a reviewer during your uh, postdoc career if you do one. Uh, but it's also like a, in this way you can learn this skill of 
being critical and constructively uh, review other works. The other one that's also interesting, at some point you st should stop reading. Okay, this means that you should not focus 100% on reading only. Uh, it's not about stopping to read, you should never stop reading, but you should like spend a minimum, uh, no, uh, only a fraction of your time on reading. So if you say, no, this is related to the procrastination, uh, to try to avoid uh, saying like I'm spending all of my time on reading, just say, if you feel that you're spending too much time on reading, just say, I'm going to limit my time uh, to maximum, I don't know, one day in a week reading and everything else I'm going to focus on my research. In that case, you can say this is a, a threshold above which I should not uh, go for uh, the reading activities. This one is also very useful. I, I, I had it later on my slides, but I can already talk about this. Not taking critics personally. Whenever you uh, talk about your research to your advisor or whenever you submit your paper and you want it to get accepted, it's likely that either your advisor says, no, I don't think that's a good idea or I would do it differently. Uh, or for submitted papers, it's even worse. The reviewer will be much more critical and might say, I don't like this. Uh, well, hopefully he's friendly, uh, he or she is friendly, but uh, might say, uh, you should probably, I'm rejecting this paper for this and this reason. So it is, uh, there is always good valid reasons. Normally, uh, if a reviewer rejects your work, it's for a good reason, normally. Uh, and in that case, you should accept the criticism and try to learn from it and not, not be personally offended by this, but like to see, okay, what is the reason behind it? What is the reason why this, uh, I get this uh, rejection and try to learn from this and not see this as a personal uh, thing. But the most important thing is whenever you get reviews that are negative, try to see behind the reasons for this and trying to see what can I improve to make it less negative uh, next time. Now I can finally go to uh, the more specific uh, advices. Uh, so we already, the first one was uh, have a good PhD thesis statement. Uh, the other one is uh, like take responsibility for your actions. What do I mean by this? It's basically like no one else will write the PhD thesis for you. No one else will do your research. It's uh, your responsibility. So it's, it's like related to this procrastination. If you don't do things, if you don't work uh, constantly, if you don't spend effort in doing your PhD, you will not get much out of it. So the more effort uh, you spend in doing your PhD, the more likely it is that you will get a PhD and you will get a good PhD. Yeah, the planning, uh, so time management, uh, that's also important. And that's maybe something that's like uh, sometimes uh, overlooked in the sense that, of course, you have to plan ahead of time and you have to know what you're doing. The most challenging part here is to know how to plan uh, at different uh, time frames at the same time because you will have to do short-term planning, you have to do medium-term planning and you will have to do long-term planning all at the same time. Uh, examples of uh, short-term planning is like every year there is probably one or several major conferences or workshops in your field. You want to submit papers to this. So this means that already uh, like one year uh, before you have to say, okay, I know that, I don't know, next in November, there will be a conference submission deadline. Uh, starting from this, start counting backwards. Uh, this means that I have to start working at least two months, probably more in advance to start working to some uh, results. It depends on how much experiments you have to do. Maybe you have to work like nine months uh, in advance already uh, to be able to reach this deadline and to have any success of getting uh, accepted. So this is short-term planning, but short-term is still several months uh, ahead of time. Uh, if you just uh, don't do this and you just happen to know like two weeks before the deadline, oh, there is this conference coming up, then you can forget about it. Except if you still have some uh, paper floating around so that you can directly submit. But it's much less likely that you will get uh, accepted simply because you started working uh, too late. There's probably other examples of short-term deadlines that, uh, that we can add here. Uh, medium term, in medium term, for you it's probably long term. For those that start a PhD, for me it's medium term. This is your PhD itself. When will you defend your PhD? This is medium term in the sense that it will be maximum four years, probably sooner for uh, most of you. Uh, but yeah, so it's, it's medium term. Long term is what happens after your PhD. That's the long term vision. Uh, during your PhD, still slightly less, uh, slightly shorter than your PhD itself is 
research visits of longer duration. Say you want to, during your PhD, do a visit at some research lab uh, abroad. Uh, it can be a one to three months, maybe six months research visit. It's not something that you can just decide from one day to the other, because first of all, you probably need research funding for this. Research funding for these types of longer stay visits take time to get. There is probably specific deadlines for submitting these uh, research proposals to get the funding. You also have the, to have the approval of your advisor. You have the approval of the lab that you're going to visit. So this typically takes like one year ahead of time uh, easily to be able to plan this because you also have to fit this with whatever other research or maybe you have to do some teaching. You have to make sure that your teaching load will be reduced during that visit. So that's uh, something that needs to be planned uh, ahead of time, like, but here it's longer term than this one. This is like a couple of months. This is my, maybe sometimes one year or longer. Uh, also, like again with your PhD, uh, I'm not sure if this is valid for all different types of domains, but whenever I ask one of my PhD students, how long do you plan to write your the actual writing of your PhD dissertation once all the material is there? So say, uh, the researcher has already published three, four different papers and then they say, okay, now the only thing that needs to, that I need to do is to bundle everything together in a PhD dissertation. So they always, I ask them how much time they, this will take, they say, oh no, easily one month. I say, no, I don't think it will be one month. I say, okay, maybe two months. No, it will not be two months. So in the best case, they might say three months, but uh, out of experience, I see it always takes like a, somewhere between three and six months, and six months is much more use, us, usual. So it's something that takes time because you have several revisions. You need to, it's not just bundling uh, a couple of uh, papers together, and it needs to be revised with several iterations where your PhD advisor needs to approve this. So it takes uh, time to do this uh, properly. So definitely don't underestimate this and don't start doing this uh, last minute. Also, of course, you can reduce this uh, time if you start focusing from the beginning uh, on the writing, but from the beginning it might be difficult because you don't necessarily already know what you're going to write uh, uh, in the beginning. So the long term, as I mentioned, is everything be, uh, after the PhD. So what are you going to do? If you, it depends. Maybe you do some, you envision some academic career or you envision some professional career. In both cases, the type of planning you want to do might be different. For example, if you want to become a professional in some company, it might be useful that during your PhD career, you already have uh, established some contacts with companies. You already collaborate with companies during your PhD. If you want to do an academic career, then you should do all of the things that are valued in academy. So I mentioned here uh, research visits of longer duration. Research mobility is considered as something good. So if this is something you want to do, then make sure that you have, uh, have done at least some, some decent research mobility abroad, that you have good research collaborations, that you have good papers and so on. So we already saw about the practical advice for keeping focus. Uh, I've seen this several times in some of your answers. So it's again, it's about uh, planning and targeting. Uh, so I think the main reason, the main way of getting, keeping focused on the end result, which will be your PhD dissertation, is exactly this thesis statement that I mentioned before. If you have your thesis statement, this thesis statement is already said, this is the goal, this is the direction I want to go to, and you can always work towards this goal. And whenever you start doing something that doesn't really fit in this goal, you should probably avoid doing it uh, too much. So try to not deviate too much from the goal. From time to time it can be useful, like you have some maybe some uh, other colleague or some collaborator you want to work with and they do some really cool research and you just want to be involved in this, it's okay. But just consider this as a sidetrack and don't let it spend too much of your time to um, uh, to do this uh, sidetrack. Always say, okay, my main goal is the most important. This is the thing on which I'm going to spend most of my time. Uh, another way of keeping your focus is to really structure whatever you're doing, structure your thoughts, structure your daily work, structure your writing, structure your code. Structuring this can be keeping an agenda. Structuring can also be, I don't know, for your code. Uh, well, if you're a developer, uh, then having well-structured code, readable code is very important for your writing, having a, always the same structure that you're going to use. Use the proper tools for doing this. 
So be structured. If you're just uh, like, whenever you have an idea, you just write it on some piece of paper. And then uh, two years later, you discover this piece of paper somewhere in an office. You say, ah, maybe I should have uh, written it down somewhere in, on my computer. Uh, Okay, another way to keep your focus, it's impossible to always keep your focus because we all know that doing research is a very intensive activity that takes a lot of brain power, resources, and uh, your brain can simply not manage to do this all of the time. So uh, it requires a lot of concentration uh, and after, a, after some time your, your brain gets tired and you cannot continue concentrating. In that case, what should you do? You should basically uh, replace this uh, very cons uh, activity that re requires a lot of concentration by some more lightweight activities that require less concentration. For example, if you're thinking about a research problem, it might be very difficult. Just writing down some ideas might be easier. Or you could also say, to after some very concentrated uh, effort, you can say, now I'm going to do some sports and to, uh, or to, to walk around somewhere uh, to do some more lightweight activities. I talked about these loose ends. It's not a problem to have them but don't do this too much but it's okay to have side tracks because it's again another way of like if you're working 100 percent of your time on exactly the same topic you will probably get bored uh, by doing so so if you have a side track sometimes it helps you to do something else uh, and then by doing something else and then you go back to your main track then you suddenly sometimes get uh, new ideas uh, because you have uh, uh, let it go for a while yeah the other uh, thing is about tracking or tracing, uh, tr keeping track of everything that you're doing. So of course it's related to uh, research, so re uh, sorry about state of the art of research. Whenever you encounter something you, you have to read lots of things and uh, you have to uh, know what is the technology being used in your field of research. So you have to keep track of this. It's not only sufficient to read all of these things, you also have to remember what you read. If I'm reading something like uh, things that I read three years ago, uh, if I didn't read, write down somewhere, what is the main takeaways, the ta main takeaway messages of whatever I read in a paper like three years ago, I will probably not know anymore today. So what you should try to do is whenever you have read a paper, either you take the paper, you have some bi bi bibliography management tool in which you store all your papers. Maybe you like to annotate them uh, manually uh, using whatever type of device you have. Maybe you want to have at the side uh, for every paper a small text document in which you write your main takeaway messages like this. Whenever you say like two years later, uh, I want to know what was the main thing about this paper, just read whatever you wrote about it at the moment you read the paper uh, to, to uh, know whether it's still uh, relevant. Uh, otherwise you will have to reread the same papers over and over again because since you're reading so much papers, you, your mind simply cannot remember everything so note down whatever you uh, had that you think is relevant. Uh, this is not only for papers, also for any technology. Uh, also, whenever you have a, a, a new research idea or you see a potential opportunity, just write it down. It might be useful somewhere. So have some kind of research notebook, preferably in an electronic form, in which you write up all of these ideas. Some people like to have an electronic form. Some people like to, write, like to have a really like a, uh, a book, a paper book, where they write everything down. This depends on what you want to have. But have some way to write down everything. Also, when you're talking to your research advisor, your PhD advisor, the same. Don't just listen to him, but whenever uh, he's talking to, to you about something, write down whatever he says, uh, because otherwise next meeting maybe he says the same thing. Or even worse, maybe he says something completely different. <laughs> So maybe today he says you should do this and then next week he said you should do that and uh, it's the opposite of what you said so if you keep it uh, if you uh, keep track of it then you can at least know uh, whether it's inconsistent and okay this writing down this can be on paper it can also be like uh, sometimes some of my students they like to simply record the meetings if you have the, of course the permission of your uh, whoever you're uh, talking to uh, and then you have a video recording or a voice recording of uh, your meetings so that you can always go back to it uh, if there are some details. Because during meetings there is a lot of things that are said, it's impossible to remember everything. Another reason for keeping track of things is because I assume that this is uh, for all of you uh, the case. You have to write an annual, maybe not, uh, I don't know how it's, but for us in, in science we have to write an annual committee meeting report. 
uh, and it's based on this that we will have our annual committee meetings. So uh, these annual reports uh, about the progress need to be written rather than uh, just uh, thinking about this like one week before the report is due and then you have to start really focusing on this a lot and, and spend all of your time on this. It's better to do this uh, gradually and regularly so that once the time is there you already have most of it written. Same for your CV. From time to time you will have to submit your CV to someone if uh, like for during four years you didn't do anything and then you have to try to think about what was all of the things I, I did. It might be difficult to complete your CV. If you just start from the beginning and keep noting down everything it will be much more easy to do this. I already mentioned mobility, so research mobility. Uh, this is very important. Uh, both in research and uh, both in academia and in, in industry. So actually try to take whatever opportunity you can have to travel and to reach out to people. Okay, during the COVID uh, it was a little bit more difficult. Uh, now it is again uh, has become possible. Uh, okay, and this uh, like mobility can uh, take place in many different ways. The, the easy ways are like you want to attend scientific conferences, scientific workshops, sem seminars, uh, summer schools. It can be abroad uh, in another country, it can be just in another university within the same country. So you have the, uh, all of this uh, counts as, uh, as traveling uh, for me and it is also a way to connect to other people. Uh, also related to this, I think uh, that's maybe it's obvious, maybe it's not, but for me, like uh, going to a conference, what is the main reason for going to conferences? It's not for uh, listening to boring talks. <laughs> uh, okay, the, it, there, is, there will be presentations. Sometimes the presentations are quite interesting. Uh, the papers themselves, you can just take the proceedings and read them uh, when you come back. The most important things about these uh, scientific events is actually the ability to talk to other people. So during your coffee breaks, do, during the social events, that's really the most important things about conferences. That's actually the, re, the main reason why conferences exist. Researchers want to talk to other researchers about their research and to know about the research of others. In most of the cases, research collaborations, they are created during these types of events. And also, most of the useful information you can get during these uh, conferences is because of the things you heard during, uh, during these coffee breaks, during these social dinners and so on. Uh, because there you get to, to know information that you will never learn by just listening to a presentation. Because a presentation is really condensed and they only tell you the relevant things about what worked, but sometimes like if you know, <coughs> you maybe have a specific ID and uh, someone else already tried it and they said you, are, you can forget about this because this doesn't work for this and this reason. Uh, they, they might tell you this uh, orally during some uh, informal talk, uh, but like the things that didn't work, probably they are not going to spend uh, their time during a real official presentation about this. Uh, Okay, okay, it might be difficult. I also, when I try to remember my very first conference, uh, okay, just trying to reach out to people and talk to some like, uh, like uh, some high, uh, uh, high level professor, uh, you are all afraid of doing this. Actually, I don't think this depends on the field, but you shouldn't be afraid of doing this. Conferences are a friendly atmosphere. People do like to talk to other people, even if you're just a PhD student and you want to talk to some researcher that has a really high profile, they are probably eager to talk to you uh, about uh, whatever you want to do. It's mostly pro problematic if you're like a more an introvert uh, person, as I am, as I used to be. Uh, okay, I'm no, no longer afraid to talk uh, to 40 persons in the room anymore. My very first presentation, I was uh, extremely afraid of, uh, of talking. It's something I learned uh, along the way. So maybe if it's difficult for you to get introduced in a new community, especially your very first conference, ideally, hopefully your PhD advisor will be there. Maybe there are some other colleagues that are there that can help you introduce the community. But maybe even if your PhD advisor is not there, he can maybe help you to already introduce you upfront before the conference to the right people and say, have a chat with this person uh, and maybe already have some email to say, okay, when you're going there, my PhD student will talk to you. So this can be also a way to, uh, to help you in doing this. Uh, so the main reason for this, uh, these scientific uh, events is to meet 
like-minded people with whom you can discuss about your research and maybe also like uh, complain about your PhD advisor. I can probably um, also recommend everyone, if you didn't already do so, is to go like to uh, most of these conferences, they have a PhD symposium. Uh, where you actually, uh, in the context of the conference, in a specific field, there is a specific track where PhD students can present their research. And it's really focused on PhD students, and where you, most of the other persons there are also PhD students, so there you can freely uh, talk about your research, complain about everything that doesn't go. It's also a really good way, these uh, events, is to increase your visibility. If people have never seen you, it might be difficult to get collaborations by going there. Uh, even if they know your work, uh, if they see you, it's, you will, it's much more easy to get new collaborations. Uh, or to have people cite your work. Um, the, probably the best way to do so is uh, also is to attend workshops and not only conferences. Workshops are much more smaller scale, even more focused, but there you have really all the persons in your very specific niche or research domain where you can talk about this. Something that really helped for me also when I was doing this was actually trying to be involved as a co-organizer in workshops. And in that case, if you have this opportunity, please do so. Because in this case, you get to know other people, you get organization skills, and people know you because you're a co-organizer, and you get all of the benefits from doing this. So this was lots of things, lots of things about mobility. And then, of course, the other mobility, uh, except for going to scientific events, is having research visits in labs abroad. So ideally, uh, it should be like, uh, okay, it depends on how much uh, budget you have or how much time you have. It can be, a, ideally, I would say a three-month uh, visit is the best uh, compromise because then, like this, you have enough time to be immersed in this lab. One month might be a little bit uh, too few because by the time one month is gone, you really get to know the people and then you have to go away uh, back to your university. But it's still better than nothing. Uh, six months is probably even better, but that can be uh, too much time in the context of only a four-year uh, career. So, but it's definitely recommended to have something like this. But again, you have to plan well ahead of time and you have to identify, of course, the research lab that is most relevant for your domain of research that Perhaps your PhD advisor has already collaborations with, perhaps it can lead to a new research collaboration. Uh, so identifying the right lab uh, is very important. Uh, once you go there, it will increase your mobility. As a result, it will increase your CV. It will be good for your academic career. It will also be good for your social skills. You will be involved in a new environment. There's only benefits uh, of doing this. Sometimes you could even uh, consider smaller uh, research visits for really specific uh, activities. So here just uh, one anecdotal uh, evidence of this. Uh, this is a picture of uh, one of my PhD students a couple of years ago here on the left. Uh, it's Adrien Coppens. He was working in the domain of uh, using virtual and augmented reality in the context of building architecture. So it's a kind of mix between science, applied science and uh, architecture. And to do so he needed to have all of this fancy material, yeah, like you, you can here see this stable device, which is actually a tactile device where you can put things on, uh, on it uh, and you can interact with it. And at the same time, you can see around the entire uh, floor, there is a 360 uh, screens where you can project things and you can interact with them. So it's really fancy equipment, uh, so fancy that it costs a huge amount of money. We, don't, we didn't have the money at our university, so we tried to identify where do they have these types of things, because that was really his domain. Uh, he wanted to do research in that particular domain. So we identified uh, the lab in Luxembourg, the uh, LIST uh, list, uh, where they had this equipment. It allowed him to do this experience. He could use this uh, to put this in his PhD dissertation. And as a result, as an end result of this, okay, he got his PhD uh, with uh, one collaboration on top of this with these partners. And uh, actually it was even more successful than this because currently after his PhD, he's now uh, working at that uh, institute um, uh, as, a, as a developer in this domain. He didn't want to stay in research, but he's still doing it as a developer within a really active uh, research domain. Yeah, maybe uh, go back to our poll. So now I'm talking about uh, software or other technical tools. So as a PhD student, you are probably likely to use some kind of tooling in the general sense uh, for doing your PhD. Think about any type of tool, software tool, hardware tool, any type of other technical tool. 
that you can think of that are indispensable, really needed for you uh, as a PhD student uh, within your domain of study. I expect probably to see uh, a mix of like generic tools that will be useful for everyone and then more specific tools that can be useful in only your specific domain of uh, research. Okay, so the obvious ones are of course any type of document writing tool, Word, uh, LaTeX, or something like this. The other things are uh, things, spreadsheets, Excel, or the equivalents of Excel. Any type of reference management tool. Uh, okay, here we see reference management, here we see Mendeley, uh, EndNote, anything about managing your scientific references, obviously. This is related to what I mentioned before, keeping track of all of your references. Something for publishing uh, like your data sets uh, like Zotero. Specific tools uh, for scientific computing or SPSS. Uh, these are more specific in specific domains. Any tools for doing scientific analysis, for statistical analysis. So there is a mix of uh, focus tools within your domain. I don't see any like, uh, okay, uh, of course we have the everything new here. The <laughs> I was expecting this, uh, I didn't have this like uh, last year uh, when I presented it, but any type of AI tool you're doomed to use this <laughs> for some reason. Try to use this at the, in the best way possible and know about the limitations of uh, this don't trust ChatGPT for anything. You can use it, but don't trust it. So I will give you some examples. No, I'm not sure if, yeah, I will also give you examples in my specific fields, but in any specific fields, there is uh, like tools like this that can be extremely useful. Yeah, so this is like uh, the last time I gave this presentation, I got these types of results. It's okay, there was already apparently ChatGPT, <laughs> uh, so that's good. Uh, so, so here we said, this was more in a computer science uh, field, so there we see other types of things, uh, like okay, this is some kind of database tooling, this is Stack Overflow, uh, VS Code for software development. So obviously in that domain you see much more software development related, but all of the other things are uh, very similar, uh, bibliography tools, Zotero, LaTeX, calendar, calendar um, reference managers, and so on. So that's obvious that, uh, yeah, but the main practical advice is to use the right tools for the right purpose, which means also to know what are the tools uh, available in your domain. Uh, maybe the recommendations I'm going to give here are not the ones that are valid in your domain, uh, but the best way to know this is talk to your colleagues about what is the tools they are using and try to select the best one. So maybe obvious ones that you didn't list, uh, but that are also ex extremely relevant is a backup mechanism. Any type of backup, I would say the best one is uh, just have some kind of external hard drive that you link to your computer every week, maybe even every day to have an automatic backup, which is not on the cloud, which is not on your computer itself, but that allows you to have a backup. I can tell you many stories of PhD students or even postdocs that lost all of their data simply because their either computer crashed or their computer got stolen or they did some bad manipulation where they reformatted their hard drive by accident. <laughs> uh, so this happens. Try to have a mix of different backups. Uh, external hard drive, uh, having some cloud storage that you can use for uh, storing the important uh, things and have a way of recovering this easily. Antivirus tool is also something that should not be uh, underestimated. Uh, it's related to reasons why something can uh, break if you have a virus that infests your uh, system. Obviously, video conferencing tools are now, uh, you have to use them every day. Uh, choose whatever is most appropriate. Uh, so I use a mix of uh, all of these different uh, tools. And then uh, this is specific in my domain, so maybe it's not relevant for you, but I'm a software developer, so I use collaborative software development tools like GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, uh, Git, and I use communication tools specifically dedicated to software developers like Slack uh, and some others. So these are like generic tools. I didn't mention Excel and Word, that's uh, obvious. Uh, okay, here there is, it's not Excel and Word, but uh, when I'm Preparing papers, I t tend to use uh, LaTeX and Overleaf. If you prefer to use Word, that's your choice. The main thing is try to decide what is the best thing for your purpose. In scientific, uh, in, in most scientific uh, research, we prefer LaTeX for because it's required for some uh, publications, but also because it like like really 
speeds up your productivity of writing because there is already like all of these templates available, especially for the bibli bibliography management with BibTech. It makes your life much more easy. Uh, for presentations, you have, of, of course, lots of different choices. I didn't see PowerPoint in your list uh, here, but are any type of presentation tool. This is not complete, of course, PowerPoint, Keynote, Beamer, or other presentation tools. Obviously, you're going to use this for your presentations. So the main message is choose the best one that's most appropriate for your needs. It can be, your needs could be simply based on because it's the best tool available or it because it's simply more logical to use. For example, PowerPoint, everyone is using, so you can easily copy paste or reuse some slides from others, uh, even if it's not the best tool around. Bibliographic references, you already mentioned this uh, a lot. So anything, any type of uh, tool like Google Scholar, Mendeley, Zotero, uh, everything that's out there for trying to find back bibliographic references or the new breed of AI based uh, tools like this, which are uh, even much better uh, because they allow you to uh, automatically keep track of new papers. It automatically suggests you based on your previous lists uh, to provide new things. I don't know if you are aware of this. I can show you, uh, I have some slides about this. Research Rabbit and Semantic Scholar are things that I've started to use like uh, since two, three years, which are extremely useful for me. With this, I can find papers. With this, I store the papers and I have, for example, with Semantic Scholar, I have a weekly update of everything that is within my domain of research and I can simply say, okay, please add this to my lists in specific domains. And then, of course, any kind of digital library within the, your domain of research for any of the publishers where you publish regularly, IEEE, ACM, Springer, Elsevier, or what's there. In principle, you might not need this because Google Scholar knows everything, but sometimes it can be useful. So uh, maybe just some small thing about this AI based tools, because maybe not all of you are aware of this, but like this, for example, this is research rabbit. Uh, so this is just a screenshot of what I uh, have taken. Uh, so the nice thing about this is that yeah, one thing is that you can classify your papers in specific domains. So here, for example, you can see bots. So I've created a category which is bots, which is uh, I'm doing research in software development bots. So automated tools for helping software developers. Within this domain, I'm collecting all of the papers within that specific domain. So there is, okay, this was when I started doing this. There's only five papers, but uh, today I have like uh, 100 papers around. You can s easily add papers. Uh, and whenever you have a, a, a list of papers within that specific uh, domain, uh, it automatically, as you can see here, suggests you what is similar work. It tries to look at similarities of other papers within the same domain. It lists already 383 possibilities. You can simply open this, go over this and say this is relevant, this is not relevant and so on. And it starts learning and whenever you add something, you just have a bigger list. So without having to actively go to Google Scholar and copy paste all of these things, you get this for free. Similar work are things that you didn't reference to yourself, things that don't reference work in your list, but that are considered similar. Earlier work are things that have been cited in some of the things in your list, and uh, later work are things that, that, you, that cite uh, the, the things in your list. So you can go backwards in time, you can go forward. This is a really easy way to explore papers within your field of research. Uh, another way to do this is this one. You can see it also generates some kind of, if you want to, uh, a social network, a collaboration graph of everyone in that domain that is doing research. Uh, so here I see like uh, some main papers that have been written. So I only have a, a couple of them. Uh, it's not the papers, but the authors. And uh, they are linked to each other to see, okay, we have this uh, network of people that are mostly writing in this domain. Here, for example, you see a cluster of papers written by Wessel. So it seems that this is one of the most important researchers in that field. This could also be useful if you're going in a new field to identify what are the key players in that field. And of course, from this you can export in whatever uh, format you want to. You can even share publicly your list with someone else so that you can work together on creating a, a, a list of papers within a particular domain. So that's a natural way of exploring papers within a domain and for the rest it works like any other bibliography management tool because you can store your papers, you can annotate your papers and so on. Another one that is similar but is more textual based so it doesn't have these gra fancy graphics is this one, uh, Semantic Scholar. So you can basically do the same thing. You can classify your papers in different categories. 
you can easily add papers to it. It has slightly less functionalities than the previous one, but for example here you have this uh, research feed and in your settings you can say every week report me on the newest uh, publications in this field and then you can add this uh, little by little. So this is uh, easy for me because uh, rather than having to once a week go and look uh, on the internet for new papers, I just wait until it sends me a mail with new papers. Uh, okay, maybe it doesn't find everything, but it's quite complete. Uh, it frequently reports me papers that I would not even have been able to find myself because it looks in specific, uh, sometimes it looks in specific conferences that I don't even know that existed and it still reports relevant papers. Uh, then, of course, when you write papers, you have to share your papers, but not only your papers, any type of research artifact that you're producing, you should preferably share this with other people. So in my case, I'm writing papers, publications, but I'm also, we are also developing tools in our lab. We are creating data sets, we are creating YouTube videos, we are creating presentations. Do not only share your papers, try to share everything that you make, because this is about open research. Everything that you do, try to share it with others, if you have, of course, the permission, if there is no uh, uh, intellectual property rights or something, or uh, other copyright related things. Uh, the more you share, if it's of course, don't share something that is bad quality, well, actually ensure that whatever you do is good quality, <laughs> and then you can share everything you have. Uh, and uh, share it in through the uh, most appropriate means. So preprints of papers, even if they are not published, and you have the right to do so, you can put them on archive. Uh, or ResearchGate, data sets, you will probably use Zenodo or Figshare, open source software that you're developing, uh, or even closed software, as long as you put the license, you can put this on GitHub or GitLab, and everyone has access to it. Slides, presentations, you can use SlideShare, Speaker Deck. I tend to use all of those whenever I have material that I find useful for uh, the community. I will put them available so that other people can build on uh, this information. And at a, as a side effect, uh, it's likely that people get, are more likely to get to know your work, maybe just because they encounter this uh, data set and through this they will encounter your papers or vice versa. Uh, and then of course, uh, try to disseminate your research through other means like social media channels. LinkedIn, be active on LinkedIn, and through this you can also, whenever you have a new paper, just announce it on LinkedIn or on Twitter, X, uh, or on YouTube. Uh, I didn't put TikTok, I'm not a fan of TikTok. <laughs> uh, and then uh, this is another one, for example, okay, we have, I don't, yeah, this is ResearchGate, I don't know if you're aware of ResearchGate. Uh, it's like, uh, okay, if you don't like creating your own website, uh, but you still want to share your research, just uh, create a page on, uh, res on ResearchGate. It's uh, for researchers, by researchers. So like here, uh, whenever you have a new paper, just add it there and you get uh, here the list of all research uh, having been uh, submitted, in this case by myself. So this is my uh, ResearchGate page and you can, uh, you can see, uh, you can list whatever you want, articles, books, book chapters, conference papers, even data, technical reports, presentations. So it's a kind of vitrine uh, where uh, all of my, uh, scientific output uh, is stored in a unique way. The nice thing also is that you can uh, do this by research topic, but also uh, you can have, say, uh, everything related to a particular project, you can bundle it together. You can even say everything related to a particular research lab or a research group, you can bundle it together. So it's really flexible from that point of view. And in addition to this, one of the main reasons why I'm using it is that sometimes you have research articles, like uh, in a journal, we don't have the right to uh, make them publicly available because we have to respect the copyright of the journal uh, but you just put them on the research uh, gate and whenever someone would like to see it he can just uh, click on some button ask you for a private copy of the paper and then you just say okay here it is yeah this is uh, like the same so this is my uh, youtube channel where i also try to this is i use this both for teaching and research purposes so whenever there is a useful uh, presentation I gave at some conference, I will probably post it here and whenever I'm doing some, something relevant for research uh, or for teaching that is useful to a bigger audience than only my students, then I will also uh, publish it here. So all of this uh, should be seen in the context of uh, open research. I think as a research community, we should make all of our research openly available to the extent possible because 
Research is about building on the, sh on the shoulders of other researchers. If you don't have access to what other researchers are doing, you cannot build further on this. If you are not able to verify or uh, re replicate what other researchers are doing, you cannot trust that research. So that's why any research, I think, should respect the FAIR principles. I don't know if you know these uh, principles. FAIR is an acronym. If you want to have all the details, just go to this website. But it means like all research should be findable. You should be able to access it, to find it. So yeah, it's the same. First of all, you need to, be to find it. Then you should have access to the research. So you should be able to download it. Uh, interoperable is you should be able like this is more about replication if you have some research you should be able to repeat the research yourself so all of the information to repeat it by yourself should be available to the extent possible it's not always possible in specific domains maybe you are doing some medical experiments with thousands of patients I don't think you can easily replicate this but you can put the methodology available so that someone can maybe with like two years of time uh, or maybe 20 years of time do the same thing and it should be reusable, so everything that allows other people to uh, reproduce results. So everything is more about research reproducibility. How can we uh, make other people benefit from our research and do the same thing themselves or do more things on top of what we just uh, provided? That's why all of your research should be available, not only your papers, but all your datasets and uh, tools. Uh, also, it's a very good practice to use uh, DOI for all of them. So normally, I think for papers, it's now standard. Whenever you have a published paper, there will be a digital object identifier. But the same thing can, and, uh, can also be added to datasets and tools. Like if you put something on Zenodo for free, you get the digital object identifier. And like this, you have a unique single identifier for every type of research artifact that you're producing. So consistently use this for referring to your work. About research reproducibility, this was only very specific to my domain of research in uh, software engineering. So I don't think it's uh, relevant here, but it's like uh, uh, it was a paper in which they studied to which extent the reproducibility of research is improving over time. Uh, so they actually looked in some specific conference about uh, the conference was about software engineering. Uh, they try to assess to which extent papers that have been published in this domain like 15 years ago were redu reproducible. They tried to reproduce the research and they failed uh, by a large extent for most of them. They did it then more recently and now it's like 80% of the results are actually reproducible. I guess that maybe in the field of software engineering it's easier because you can share software much more easily than uh, other material. But uh, I think that's uh, where we should try to go towards is to try to make your research as reproducible as possible. To do so, you will have to provide replication packages. So here I realize that I might be becoming a little bit more specific in my uh, domain of research. Uh, okay, replication packages, something that helps someone else to reproduce your research. In the context of my domain, it's easy because a replication package is simply a software package. If you're doing research on a specific machine, I don't think you can package the machine and <laughs> give it to someone else. But something that provides all of the information that allows someone else to repeat your findings and see whether whatever you did uh, is correct uh, and can be confirmed or refuted if it's not correct. Maybe it's correct, but not in another setting. So maybe they can say in that other setting, it's not the same thing. If you provide such a replication package, of, of course, it should be as easy as possible for someone else to read it and to reproduce it. So you should be structuring it uh, in the best way possible so that uh, also because maybe things can change over time. You can say, for example, I developed this using this particular version of this software system uh, at this particular date. Uh, this is the information that can be found. Uh, in any type of research, things are changing, evolving over time. So if I would do the same experiment again, like uh, one year later, the data might, al might already been, uh, have been changed. So it's not always fully reproducible. But if you document it, at least you know what are the constraints that were in place at the moment the experiment was done. If you didn't put this, then maybe someone might say, OK, your research is not correct. But uh, maybe because he's yeah, like, I'm doing the same thing two years later, and the results are different. Is it because the original research was incorrect? No, maybe it's because 
the research now is done in a different context and the context has changed. If you provide the context, then you provide more uh, certainty about in which context this research has been conducted. Uh, so in my domain, if you talk about replication packages, this would be something like uh, we develop software in, uh, in Python. So that for this, we use reproducible notebooks, which we create using JupyterLab. So we develop uh, Python code. It looks something like this. Uh, actually, it's like writing a paper, but this is not a paper. This is like uh, the full code, executable code, with all of the images that you will see in the paper. And if someone wants to repeat the experiments, uh, it suffices to just install the notebook, run the notebook, and you get all of the results for free. So the data set will be there, the code will be there, and the results will be there, and you can simply re-execute this and it should work. So for this, of course, we have to share the paper, we will have to share the notebook, and we will have to share the source code. So for this, we use three different uh, mechanisms. Uh, the publication itself, on Zenodo, the data set, and on GitHub, we provide the source code. So of course, there is a lot of things you need to do to make your research uh, available. Uh, but by doing so, anyone else can look into it. If they find a bug in the code, well, they can simply correct it. They can provide a bug uh, report uh, on GitHub and so on. This is specific in the domain of computer science, but it can work in many other domains, having some kind of computational notebook that can help others to reproduce your research. Another practical advice is about collaboration. So that's the social skills. You should try to collaborate as much as possible. So we already mentioned having weekly, hopefully meetings with your supervisor. More than weekly is not feasible. Maybe bi-weekly meetings, maybe monthly meetings. But uh, if your supervisor is not there, hopefully you're in a team where there's other PhD students. You can hopefully talk with them. If there are no other PhD students in your team, probably there is other, well, there is already 20 PhD students here. You can talk to other PhD students in other fields. It can already be useful as well. Maybe there's other PhD students you know in other uh, universities close by, like, like say within Belgium. Uh, you can also discuss with them regularly if they have mutual interests and then uh, have every opportunity to have uh, collaboration, to, to, to talk with other people might be an opportunity for collaborating with them, uh, write joint papers together, together develop some joint tools, create uh, benchmarks and data sets together, uh, try to seize the opportunity of collaborating if it's possible and if it fits, of course, within your uh, research domain. I already mentioned also the ability to co-organize scientific workshops. If you see this occasion, try to use it. Uh, another way of collaborating, I don't know, but I guess that you will also have, since you're doing high-end research, uh, master students typically uh, might do a master's thesis uh, that would be research-related. So propose topics that master thesis could take, and like this you can actually uh, start practicing your supervision skills, uh, your teaching skills to teach the master students how to do research and maybe they will become the next uh, PhD student uh, as well. And then uh, uh, maybe if you're doing more industrial-like research, interacting with companies, trying to apply your research in practice could also be uh, very useful. This is not applicable for everyone but uh, might be useful in your sp specific context. I don't think that's a no-brainer. Everyone should publish regularly, there's a famous publish or perish uh, thing, but uh, there may be some specific practical advice. Publishing regularly, that's not what you should do. What you should do is publish high quality research. So if you want to publish, you should be, try to be as ambitious as possible, but not over ambitious. Maybe there is like this top uh, conference in your field, like an A star rated conference, the best you can think of with a uh, acceptance ratio of 5%, uh, maybe that's too far-fetched if you're a beginning PhD student. Maybe near the end of your PhD, it might be achievable. Uh, so try to see whether uh, like you should go for the really top of the top of the conferences or maybe something that's still in the top but not the, the highest. So try to aim for quality, not quantity. It's better to have a couple of high quality papers than lots of shitty papers. <laughs> and if you can do this normally in every domain, it might be difficult for you to know what are the top conferences, ask your advisor or someone that knows and go for those that are highly rated. So typically conferences are rated from A star, which is the highest, then A, then B, then C and so on. 
try to forget about the B conferences, go for the A conferences. There is normally, it depends on your domain, maybe there is uh, not a lot of conferences and maybe you don't have lots of choice. So maybe you, you have to select uh, some B conferences, but like in my field of research, fortunately we have rankings. I don't know about if this is general for other fields. The core ranking, this is something in uh, Australia, they have conference rankings, so to see whether this also applies for your field of research. Uh, when you type, I type the domain software and I see it's all software related conferences, I get this list, I order them by ranking and I can immediately see what are all the research conferences in my field. There is only very few A star rated conferences. I, I tend to go for A conferences because they are more achievable by PhD students. So uh, if they are the main uh, researchers, we focus uh, more on them. A is definitely uh, good enough. We don't strive to be the best of the best. We do, but uh, we don't strive for really trying to be uh, here uh, si for simple reasons like this conference, for example. If you see, uh, you have to wait for six months before you get, ex uh, be before even you get an answer. At the same time, uh, you could already have written a paper, have a, uh, a response from another conference and resubmit it elsewhere. So it's a kind of trying to find the right balance between going to a high quality conference, but not spending too much time. What happens if the paper gets rejected? Uh, you, you only have a limited time, so try to balance to select the right conferences uh, that are good enough. They used to also have something for journal rankings. Unfortunately, this is discontinued, at least in my domain of research. Maybe they still exist in others. But uh, yeah, we also, like when we write papers, we try to focus on the top A-rated uh, journals as well. Another question is, yeah, what should you go to? Should you try to prefer publish papers in journals or conferences. I cannot make any recommendations. It really depends on the field. In the field of software engineering, there is no difference. You can submit to conferences, you can to submit to journals. Maybe if you're going to a university, you want to become a professor, maybe journals might be more important than others because you're competing with other persons in other domains of science. And in other domains, journals are more important. Having a good balance between journal papers and conference papers might be good, but it's really domain specific. When you are facing doing a PG, you are facing a couple of challenges. So this is a list of challenges uh, that people have reported uh, in the past. As a PhD student, you can see lots of challenges. I'm pretty sure that uh, whenever you see this list, you can tick uh, several of these boxes uh, already. Yeah, some of them are related to things we already mentioned before, like time management, deadline pressure. Others might be uh, more uh, social or psychology related. Lack of confidence, insomnia, emotional events, events investment, depression. Uh, so yeah, you have lots of challenges that you uh, can have as a PhD student. So here I try to uh, provide some ideas to try to overcome these challenges to the extent possible. It's not always easy. So I already mentioned the good life, uh, work-life balance. So don't neglect your family or your friends and especially don't neglect yourself. So have a good balance. Don't only work on your research, try to do something else. Engage in sports, in cultural activities, have some holidays. Uh, definitely don't forget uh, about this. Uh, this was again related to, uh, I don't know who mentioned it, about feeling negative when someone critiques your work. This actually you should see any critique on your work as something positive. It's really very important uh, to get criticism. It's only by being criticized about what you're doing uh, that you can uh, improve upon your research. So any criticism that you can, can consider, that you can get, consider it as posit positive because it will challenge you to if you get criticism, then either it may, may, make, may mean that you didn't do something right, or it may mean that you did something right, but you didn't explain it properly. So uh, whatever the reason for the criticism, there is something you can probably improve upon. Try to express your thoughts better, try to explain your ideas better, try to do better research. Uh, so never take criticism personally. Try to take abstraction of uh, yourself, but try to see this is criticism on your work. It's not on you as a person. Take the feedback and try to, if you really don't know, like uh, sometimes you get a paper rejected, lots of criticism. Uh, the first time even anyone will say, okay, why did he do this? I don't agree, but try to uh, step back. Try to also show this uh, feedback to some of your colleagues and you will start to learn why they provided this criticism and how you could uh, cope with it. There is always something to learn. If it's not relevant, then for me it always uh, means 
well, we didn't explain what we meant good enough. Uh, so try to explain better what you did next time. If the research, you think the research is really relevant, just explain it better next time. If the research is not good enough, try to do the research better next time. Uh, so try to see how you can integrate whatever feedback you received. Of course, yeah, another one challenge is doing a PhD, you will probably have noticed, it's not a 9 to 5 job. You cannot say, I'm going to the office in the morning, at 5 o'clock I stop, and then my job is done, and after four years, by uh, automatically I will get a PhD. No, uh, it's, this is again timing related, planning related. It's up to you to plan ahead so that uh, you don't get stuck with uh, deadlines where you only have two days left uh, to write a paper that will take one week to write because then you will have to work in the weekend. So that's about procrastination. Uh, you can try to f fit your research within the time frame that you have uh, by trying to plan uh, everything and try to not avoid doing everything at last minute. Uh, I always try to say this to my PhD students, but they not always uh, listen to me in the sense that, okay, I say there is a conference in four months from now, maybe you start, should start writing, and then uh, one month before the conference they say, maybe we should start writing, and then it's uh, too late. So if you plan ahead, then uh, it will work. If you start too late, it might not always work. I don't know if you can guess what this is about. Uh, this is about getting stuck in your research. Uh, actually, this is a quote from uh, someone, uh, another professor that I saw on Twitter. Any research student, any PhD student, at any moment in his career will have faced a problem where uh, he doesn't know how to continue. You say, everything I tried, it fails, uh, I'm depressed, I don't know how to continue. So uh, you hit rock bottom and nothing works, everything is hopeless. Uh, you always have a, like you have ups and downs. Uh, you, at some point you will reach uh, some downs that are where you think nothing works, but actually this is the, 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 the biggest learning experience. You will uh, recover by talking to people. You can try to see what are your struggles, why are you facing this problem? And at the end, uh, the most biggest learning experience is uh, recovering from uh, the moments where you don't know uh, how to continue. So it happened to me at least twice in my career uh, as a PhD student. Uh, the second time it happened, I basically said I'm going to switch uh, topics. And I <laughs> uh, this was after two years. I had fortunately six years because I was a teaching assistant. After two years, I said I'm going to completely switch topics and I'm going to do something else. And this was uh, more successful. Uh, another one that probably should be a separate slide is this one, the imposter syndrome. Everyone is having this uh, even people like me are having this, we you probably have already uh, heard about this, it's like uh, you think there's always people that are better than you. Uh, it's like thinking that like if I'm, I'm a software engineer and I have to sometimes explain things about software engineering to people that are like uh, 10 times better software developers that, than I am. Psychologically, sometimes you can feel isolated as a PhD student. It's difficult to do a PhD, you are on your own. You have to write a PhD, not someone else. So it's a long project, it's mostly you have to do this independently. You can have the help from some others, but you have to write the PhD, you have to do the research. Maybe your advisor is not always as much there uh, to help you as he can. So in that case, again, talk to other people, collaborate with other people, that's probably the best way to uh, not feel isolated. Don't stay in your, uh, on your own and, and uh, try to reach out to other people. Uh, also, sometimes, actually, Regularly, it could be that your PhD advisor, you have chosen a particular domain of research, you are the expert in this domain of research, maybe your PhD advisor is not. This happened for me with a guy that I showed you uh, that went to Luxembourg. Uh, he was doing a research uh, about virtual reality, I'm not really an expert in this, about architecture, building architecture, I'm not an expert in this. So, uh, okay, uh, he had to develop software, I'm an expert, but like in 60% of the things he were doing, I was not an expert, so that's why he had to seek out collaborations with some external uh, partner to do this. So these were the challenges as uh, PhD students. I still have slides, but this is about after the PhD. So, okay, if now you have a PhD, so let's say everyone here will get a PhD in two to four years, uh, one to, no, but anywhere between one and four years. Uh, what is next and what you should do for trying to plan for next? So this is the long-term planning. Okay, that, that's, uh, you have seen this is the juggling with 25 uh, balls in the air at the same time. Okay, it depends. Uh, if you want to 
uh, go for a professional career, you don't want to stay in academia, then basically what you have to try to value is not the skills of like saying, okay, I have become a world-class domain expert in my very small little field of research. No, professionals, uh, the industry doesn't care about this. Okay, of course you have to be, if you want to go in a company that works in this specific do domain, but what is much more val uh, valued is all of the transversal skills that you uh, have uh, obtained. So anything that you have done, all of these skills that we talked about the previous time, these are the really things that you learned during your PhD. So this one small thing, being an expert, is probably relevant, but all of these other things are equally relevant. Writing a CV for a company is totally different from writing a CV for, uh, uh, for uh, in an acad acad academic context. If you want to stay in an academic career, then probably you will first have to do a small, uh, shorter postdoc research, maybe a couple of years before you can actually become an academic. Uh, you have to realize that it's really uh, not a lot of room available in the academic context to become a full-time appointed uh, academic uh, researcher. So you, uh, this might be challenging, so be aware of this. Postdoc is not, not extremely difficult to obtain, but it's uh, limited in time. So, but to do this, again, you have to try to become better in organizing things. So as a PhD student, you might not be able to organize conferences or become a reviewer or something. Uh, here you can do this. Continue having real uh, collaborations, expand your network, be involved in teaching. Actually, start applying for research projects. As a PhD student, you cannot apply for research projects. As a postdoc, you should apply for research projects. So there is many more things you can do uh, when you start doing a postdoc. So it's about like uh, finding new balls that you can st start uh, throwing around in the air. So the main thing is like getting involved in the community by actually, I know it's more like the organization, start organizing or help in organizing conferences, workshops and so on uh, by becoming part of the program committee or uh, any other role in organization. Uh, scientific journals, become a reviewer, start reviewing which might not always be possible as a PhD student, but which becomes possible as a postdoc. Start creating maybe your own scientific workshops. This is something I actively did when I started becoming a postdoc. I was an expert in my field of research and I say, let's start a workshop in a big conference on this domain of research. And this is actually how I started my, uh, my field uh, of, this was about software evolution. Uh, and this was really successful. And this is how I got to know people and how people got to know me. Maybe there is an opportunity to provide tutorials, so you have, been, you have been expert in a specific domain. Maybe you want to share this through some tutorial to the other persons within the academic community. Or something like hackathons. Uh, I don't know, I'm just uh, providing some ideas that might work or not in uh, your context. Or any other things you can think of that can help you to, to help other researchers or to help you become more visible within the research community. Obviously, uh, publishing. Uh, your results, but this is also already something that you did before, but maybe now you can take more time to increase the diversity of what you're publishing. Before it was just like uh, maybe some papers in conferences, maybe occasionally uh, in some journals, uh, but now you can uh, probably uh, do some other stuff like you, ha you know now the perfect state of the art or state of the research, so maybe there is a possibility to write some survey about everything that happens in your domain of research. Now you have become the expert. Uh, write about what are the research challenges in your domain. During four years you have known about all the problems, so you can write up about this. There is sometimes specific journals, like in my domain it's the ACM Computing Service uh, Service, which is even a star journal where you can publish these types of uh, things. Uh, these types of things are uh, things that you typically don't write when you're a PhD student, but once you acquire all the knowledge, you can start publishing these types of things. And the good thing is that it actually will boost your uh, citation count enormously. I didn't know about this when I started doing this, but uh, if you look here, if you see the number of citations and you see the topics of the papers, a survey of 1,700 citations, uh, a taxonomy of more than 1,000 citations, a state-of-the-art survey on uh, introduction on taxonomy of, if I list all of the most popular papers or uh, articles or chapters I wrote, those that, that have the most citations are those that are surveys, taxonomies, introductions to a specific theme. 
I never intended to have these papers. I think the most useful things are the things where, where I actually have a research contribution. But those things that people want to read are things where you are an expert and you want to show them, okay, what is the things going on in this field of research? And these are the things that actually get cited more. Yeah, sometimes also like these things can also be useful. Uh, occasionally you will see special issues for a specific topic, maybe in some more vulgarizing team like a magazine, not a journal. So in that case, if you see something like this, why not also contribute to these types of things? It's another type of public than the normal, regular scientific papers. Or even, why not consider to publish uh, books uh, in your domain? As a postdoc, you, can, you have the time to do this. Uh, the first one here, this is what, what I did wh while I was doing my postdoc. I didn't write the book by myself. Uh, I said, uh, I'm not the best person to write a book of, a, of an entire topic that covers this entire field on my own. It's a book with invited chapters with all of the experts in my domain. I also have a couple of chapters in it uh, and together we have a compilation of book topics within this domain. Uh, and again, this is something that uh, became uh, one of the things through which I became uh, known. And it's uh, another way of publishing information than uh, the regular conferences or journals. So think out of the box and try to see whether you can also contribute in this particular way. My goal was not here to say let's have a book and get more citations, it's about let's get people to know this domain uh, so that they can uh, work further and they know what's going on in this domain. Yeah, so okay, uh, you can also collaborate in many different ways. So you can write books together, you can develop software tools together, can create data sets, benchmarks together. All of these things are uh, typically that's also once you become a, an expert researcher. Having benchmarks or data sets uh, that you can share with others can be really an easy and useful way to collaborate with other persons. Or even uh, be involved in interdisciplinary research. You don't have to stick within your own specific niche. Try to see whether you can extend this to other domains of research. And of course, once you are a postdoc, then hopefully you will have more time to get involved in teaching. So that's also something if you want to be a, have an academic career, it's important to have teaching experience because they will look at, okay, you're a good researcher, but are you also a good teacher? If you don't have any teaching experience, you might not get hired simply because you don't have teaching experience. So don't forget to do this as well if you want to go to an academic uh, career, except if maybe there's opportunity to be, I don't know, FNRS uh, Chercheur Qualifié, which is 100% funded, but you have a very, very small chance of getting it. So try to <laughs> at least uh, open your chances by also doing these other things. So that's about teaching and the other is about research funding. Trying to apply for research funding uh, for yourself or for others. Maybe uh, even already during your PhD, you want to get a postdoc, there is no funding, try to get it yourself. Uh, for example, you have these Marie Curie actions. We have these uh, specific actions in the context of uh, UMONS. We have these uh, postdoc schemes as well. Uh, these allow you to apply for uh, postdoc funding. There is lots of different programs. It changes uh, every year, but there is funding for getting a postdoc. So try to uh, go for this yourself if you want to do a postdoc first. Uh, and then you can even be more advanced if you want to go for more advanced fund funding. Really uh, top of the top, go for this uh, European Research Council, uh, the, um, the, no, the ERC starting grants, um, which is the lowest level. It's really highly competitive, but this doesn't mean that you don't, uh, you cannot get it. Try to see whether you, uh, you do this. Uh, actually, you can see here talented early career scientists with excellent supervised work. Uh, why not applying for those things? Try to be ambitious. If it doesn't work, try to reuse uh, whatever you submitted for somewhere else. There is lots of different types of project funding that you can apply for and try to do this uh, by not doing it isolated in your own team, but also to collaborate with other persons, maybe some inter-faculty research project, inter-university research project, or even an international, international or interdisciplinary research project. And then of course, don't despair. Uh, like <laughs> Sometimes you can get an excellent rating for your project, excellent A, and then you get rejection due to lack of financial means. This happens. It's not because you have an excellent project that it will get uh, funded. So if this happens, yeah, don't despair. Try again uh, next time, uh, resubmit it uh, somewhere else. These are the things in life that happen. And yeah, once you have uh, this postdoc uh, career experience, then you can start trying to look for tenure track positions. Don't try to focus too narrowly. You say, I only want to have a position here locally in Mons. Probably you will have much less chances if you say, I want to do it somewhere in Belgium. 
or uh, somewhere in Europe or even in the entire world. Uh, so for me, for example, again, uh, some experience. When I started looking for a permanent position, I only looked in Flanders. So there's five different universities. I said, no problem. I, I applied for five different places. It didn't really work, so I said, okay, let's go a little bit further. And I started looking in uh, Wallonia as well, uh, three different universities, and then uh, I got uh, the position. But uh, just being too local uh, didn't work. Uh, so, yeah, that's, uh, I think, all I have to say. So the conclusion is, uh, yeah, this is what you should try to become. And uh, the balls just replies, replace this by any of these uh, skills. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Okay.